Today's uh, sermon has the cheerful title of Salvation Rejected, but uh, I think uh, this section ends very beautifully, very powerfully, and, uh, and there's an alternative to salvation rejected, that's salvation accepted. Today we're going to uh, talk a little bit about free will, free will versus determinism, but as little as I can get away with. It's, it's in the text, but I don't think that's the point of the text today. It's unavoidable that we talk about it. But this idea of free will versus determinism, and whether you've heard of that, heard of that before, it's hard to nail down because there's so many people on a spectrum, and there's some views that seem to incorporate, like Augustine had views that incorporated both uh, free will and determinism. Uh, the early church mostly leaned towards the idea of free will, and there was a fellow named John Chrysostom who really exemplified that teaching. And then shortly after him, Augustine came on the scene. And Augustine, great theologian who shaped the church, uh, and not only did he shape the Catholic church, but then through the reformational leaders, he, he was a foundational figure for teachings of uh, uh, John Calvin, and so that's how we get this idea of Calvinism, which has its roots in, in Augustine. Uh, two th ideas, you don't have to remember these words, but you, maybe you can catch the concept. One is the idea of prevenient grace versus irresistible grace. Prevenient sounds like the word previous, right? So you can think of it that way, that God applies grace to the world, and you guys know this is generally what I teach, God applies grace to the world that enables fallen people to be able to make a choice to accept God or not. Uh, if God didn't first come to us, if he didn't first love us, we would not be capable of choosing God. But because he extends out his hand to us previously, then we are, we are enabled to be able to make a choice. The idea of irresistible grace is that God from the foundations of the world decided who's going to be saved and who is not. And when his grace hits... Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. You will be saved. So though, that's the contrast between the two ideas there. And we'll talk a little bit of, more about this as we go. But I really, really don't think that this theological argument was on John's mind as he wrote this chapter. And that's why we're not going to be spending all of our time today, although we will have to talk about it. All right, turn to John chapter 12, and we're going to look from verse 37. <clears throat> We've had this building momentum as Christ is heading towards the cross very quickly as earthly ministry is coming to an end. We saw him raise Lazarus. We saw the triumphal entry where everybody is cheering his arrival in Jerusalem, but he weeps over Jerusalem because they missed the point, and we dare not miss the point. We don't want to uh, create a pocket God that's convenient for us that we can use for political reasons, that we can use to, for, for cultural reasons like the Jewish people wanted to do with Christ. They wanted to usurp him and use them for themselves, but he had a mission and they were off track. And so he wept over them because they were missing the point. Uh, so right uh, after that now, we're in ver uh, John chapter 12 from verse 37. This is a sad verse. I told you that... Uh, this is going to end up happy today. <laughs> but, but this is a tragic verse, and, and I want you to feel the weight of this as we read. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs, so many miracles, there are signs that point to who he is, what he was about, in their presence. So God incarnate, God became flesh, God setting aside his glory, love, the creator of life, Goodness incarnate comes and stands in their midst, performs miraculous signs that no human teacher could do, and it says they still would not believe in him. They still would not believe in him. Well, that's missing the boat, isn't it? What could be more tragic? What could be more fearful? What could be more lonely than having God who created you who loves you, who knows you, reveal himself to you 
in your presence, you've seen the glory of God, you know it, and you miss it. They, the Bible says they would not uh, believe. They would not believe. One of the most poignant phrases in the English language has to be paradise lost. Paradise lost. Remember, the Garden of Eden is called the Garden of Delight. Uh, animals were made for the earth. Fish were made for the sea. Birds were made for the sky. Adam was created outside of the garden, but then God placed him in the garden. Brothers and sisters, if your heart feels weary and tired of this world, if you're fed up with yourself sometimes, you're fed up with all the darkness in this world, all, all the bitterness in this world, all the hatred and anger, and you wonder, boy, this place is messed up. The reason you feel that way is because you were created for a perfect place. You were created for paradise, and your soul knows it. You, you know it deep inside that this world is not the way it's supposed to be. You can feel this shaking right down to the core of your being. Things are broken. Things are messed up, and we're not satisfied with all the pain and the tears and the suffering and the anger and the lack of forgiveness. This is not the way it was supposed to de- be. We were made for paradise, and we lost it. We lost it. And the reason we lost it was disobedience to God in grabbing at the forbidden fruit. Grabbing at said, maybe there's something better for me than God's will. Have you ever thought that? Well, you know what? <laughs> Every time we sin, we think that. On some level. On some level, we're saying, yeah, I know God, eternal, almighty, glorious, but I'm 49 years old. I think I can call my own shots or, or whatever, fill in your own age. And we grab a hold of that fruit, and what do we do every single time? We choke on it. The goodness, the, the fun, the excitement, all the, all the things that are promised by the sin, and we end up choking on, and we have divorce, and we lose our friends. And, and everywhere we see, there's, things are not the way they're supposed to be because we've choked on the forbidden fruit. Paradise lost. And Adam and Eve's children have been swimming in the dust ever since. Paradise lost. Adam and Eve took a bite of the forbidden fruit, thinking it would be a wonderful thing, but the fruit was poison. And all their children, including you and I, have been choking on the same fruit ever since. Paradise lost. All of us exiles from the Garden of Delight. God created human beings to be glorious, to love and to be loved to think, to work, to feel, to dream. But sin entered the world when our foreparents rebelled. And ever since, everything we do has been tainted and corrupted with shadow. Paradise lost, mercy missed, truth denied, blessings scorned, love ignored, salvation rejected, which is the name of the sermon today. This is the record of fallen humanity. And this is why relationships are difficult. We, we say, why can't everybody get along when husbands and wives who have pledged themselves to each other and, and who committed their love to each other have a hard time getting along? We struggle with friendships. We struggle with relationships because there's darkness in us and there's darkness in other people and things are not as they should have been. This is the record of humanity. The human race has not gone one place in this globe as we're spreading across the planet, as, as God told us to be fruitful and multiply. And no matter where we went, soon thereafter, the ground drank human blood. Because that's what we do. We're broken. We are profoundly broken. We're messed up. Brothers and sisters, we need a Savior. Uh, we, hasn't human history been long enough to show that we don't have the answer? Look at your own life. You know you don't have the answer. We have to look outside of ourselves. And salvation rejected is such a fearful, tragic concept. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God, his beauty, his standards, his perfection. And, and sometimes we argue, well, who's better? Or I'm not as messed up as you. And we like to compare ourselves with, with neighbors. And it's, it's like we're down here seeing whose anthill is bigger and God is sitting up on the moon. And he, he's looking down, and he says, looks like y'all need grace to me. And, and meanwhile, we're trying to say, well, my anthill's taller than yours. You know what? Thank goodness the blood of Jesus Christ covers all our sins. Otherwise, what hope would we have? 
We, we can't. We know better. We can't trust ourselves with this. This is something only God could do for us. Let's continue on reading there, uh, again from verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. And this is Isaiah chapter 53, a beautiful chapter. It's, uh, sometimes we say uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Isaiah is another gospel. Uh, this is so powerful and so clearly, this passage on the suffering servant, uh, Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, hundreds of years before Christ, God knew that the Messiah would be rejected. And it's still true today, brothers and sisters, that God reaching out in love, and most people are too bored, too tired, too busy to get out of bed and get to church. Most people are too bored, too tired, too busy to open up their Bible. Most people too bored, too tired, too busy to pray. Most people too bar bored, too tired, well, you get the picture, uh, to care about the things of God. Verse 39 uh, for this reason, they could not believe. So, wow, look at that. It, we start off with would not, and now we have could not believe because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, and this is before, he says, where Isaiah says elsewhere, this is before human beings put the, the numbers in there so you could find it easier, but that's Isaiah 6, verse 10. Uh, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. In other words, if they did turn, if they did repent, this is a U-turn, I'm doing things my way, my whole life I've been making my own choices, and now God has impacted me, and I'm thinking, God's ways are better than my ways. Uh, I know how to run my life into the ground. I know how to treat people badly. I, I know how to pout and complain and be unthankful. Maybe God's ways are better than my ways. And so this is a surrender. This is an act of saying, God, I want to be about you. I don't want to be the captain of my ship anymore. I don't want to be the boss of my life anymore. I don't want to be my own personal God because I make a very poor God. Lord, I need you. And then we turn to him in faith, and God is good to forgive everyone who comes to him in faith. Uh, where was I going to? 43? Yeah. And Isaiah said, because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So this is interesting. Verse 41 says this passage in Isaiah, which we're going to look at in a moment. This is when, when Isaiah the prophet is commissioned. God calls him to be his messenger in the temple. And, and John, working through divine illumination of the Old Testament, says he saw the glory of Jesus. This is called a theophany, when you see an echo of Christ in the Old Testament before he actually uh, incarnates himself uh, at, at uh, what we say is Christmas. Yet, at the same time, even among the leaders believed in him. So first we had this group of people who, who would not believe, then could not believe. Now we have people who, in a sense, believe, but look what happens here. But, because of the Pharisees, who were the conservative religious leaders of their time, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be cast out of the synagogue and we started this, verse 37, with a very tragic verse saying, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe. Here's another tragic sentence. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. They didn't want to say they were Christians. They didn't want their friends and their coworkers to know that they've made a change and that they're surrendering their hearts and lives to Christ they didn't want to talk about this surrender. They didn't want people around them to look down at them. They didn't want to lose the respect or the image that they had with others. In this culture, the synagogue was everything. It was the center of family life. It's the way church used to be, you know, in the West, in the United States. Everybody would come together, and you'd be at the church all the time. Uh, we're, we're trying to do that. But uh, this this time and place to be kicked out of the synagogue was to lose your connection through the synagogue to God and, and to lose all maybe business opportunities, your networking opportunities, and that's where your relatives are. There's where your friends are. That's where all, your, 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 all the people that you love in your community are there, and the Pharisees were going to kick people out <laughs> if they were connected with Christ. Verse 39 again, they could not believe 
verse 37, they would not believe. This is a process of becoming hard-hearted. Uh, we don't know when our hearts become so hard that there's, they can't be softened anymore, that there's no hope of repentance. We don't know when that happens. And so our job is to keep holding out the love of God, keep holding out grace opportunities. Our church is filled full of people who at one time people would have said of that person, they'll never be a Christian. That person would never step foot in church. And they're full of the love of Christ, uh, worshiping uh, each and every week. So we don't know who is beyond the reach. But God in heaven knows when this person is rejected and rejected and rejected, their heart has become calloused. Their heart has become so hard that there's no longer, they, they be, have gone from would not to could not. Uh, verse 40, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their uh, eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. This passage again comes from uh, the, the, the calling, the commissioning of the great prophet Isaiah, and I'm going to read from you from chapter 6. You can follow along or you can just listen if you'd like. In your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 6 from verse 1. And he, he gives a specific time stamp on this. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And remember, we just saw that John says he's talking about Christ. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces from his glory, and with uh, two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have their eyes to know and to see? Verse 4, At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from this to with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt has been taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? The, the royal we there. And, uh, and I said, here I am, send me. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. You encounter living God and God says, I want to make you fishers of men. He says, go out into all the world, making disciples of all people, teaching them to obey everything I've taught you is Christ's great commission that he keeps giving at the end of his ministry. And how should we respond? Here's how we should respond. Here I am, send me. Uh, I remember that's the way my heart was before I, I went to uh, Japan as a missionary, before I, I started any ministry in the United States or in Japan, before we started this church. God, I'm not much. God, I don't have this ability or that talent. I can't do this or that. I know my inadequacies, that inadequacy, Lord. I, without your blood, I would say, woe is me. Lord, I'm not much, but here I am. That's a comfort to me many times. I don't have to be all of that. Uh, God, God, listen, listen, please. God values availability in a heart that desires to serve more than all the talents and abilities in the world. Amen. Be here and say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Please use me, send me, speak through me, work through me, bless through me, love through me, Lord. Please use me. There could be nothing I would desire more than to be an instrument uh, set apart, sanctified for your use. And I said, here I am, send me. Isn't that beautiful? He's, he's first, woe is me. He's so miserable because he's a sinner and he knows it and his culture is sinful and God forgives his sins and, and, and then says, God says, who am I going to use? And it just erupts out of him. Even though he's terrified, the whole place is shaking with the glory of God. God says, who can I use? And he says, here am I. God, I'm right here. Please use me. And God said, go and tell these people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving, make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their ears, eyes. And John Piper uh, said that what makes them so hard-hearted, it's God's glory. They don't want to see God's glory. When we see real God, what does that mean? We're not God. 
When we see real God, what does that mean? He's up here, we're down here, and we're tiny. And we don't get to call the shots. We, don't get to sh- we, we, we can't shake our fists at heaven. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever anymore. So we, we see the real God, we see his glory, and what does that do? A lot of people's hearts are hardened and they turn away. And, and Piper said, they want a God they can carve out of wood. You know what we've been saying? We've called it a pocket deity, right? We want a convenient God that we can put in our pocket, take out for good luck, you know, when we want, we want a little something, want a little safety, want a better job, want more money or whatever, take out God. No, no longer convenient because he thinks he can call the shots. Who does he think he is anyways, God? And we, we put him back in our pocket. Uh, we want a convenient God. God is imminently inconvenient. He is awesome and he is glorious. And either we recognize him as God or we miss the point and we're wandering in darkness. Uh, brothers and sisters, does this have any practical application for you and I, maybe? Uh, for our own lives, right? For our own lives, that we want to be people who kneel before God, not people who walk in boastfully and tell God what to do. But also, how about when we talk about Christ to other people? Aren't we often so worried, well, I don't want to offend them. Uh, God is here shaking the planet, and we, and we try to say, Shh, God, don't be afraid. They'll run away. God says their hearts will be hardened if they're not willing to come to me on their knees. The, the, the practical application for evangelism here is we must proclaim God as glorious as he is. We have to proclaim the truth of God. Otherwise, we're bringing people to a made-up God, kind of like Santa Claus or maybe God like a vending machine. You push the right buttons, you get what you want. That's not God. We want to bring people to real God, glorious God, almighty God, who loved them so much he bled for them. This is the God. And so practical application, speak the true God. And and don't be afraid if people's hearts get hardened. God said, it's going to happen. Go out and speak the truth. Otherwise, you know, they might see with their eyes and and hear with their ears, uh, understanding with their hearts and turn and be healed. God is basically telling Isaiah to speak to the people ironically, uh, basically telling them, go ahead, be close-minded. Go ahead, miss the point. Because if you paid attention, you might understand and get saved. But people run. People run away. When Matthew quoted Isaiah, there's a parallel passage in Matthew 13. He uses a slightly different uh, translation or slightly different way to quote than, than John did. And Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 6 as saying, you will ever be hearing, but never understanding. You will, ever, you will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. This is tragedy. Verse, verse 43. For they loved human praise more than praise from God, from affirmation from God. They wanted people to think they were cool. They had their act all together instead of somebody who's on their knees and broken before the living God. Uh, Tragic. Missing God for the approval of who? Lost people. People who are, whose destiny is eternal separation from the living God. And why would we crave their affirmation, their approval at the risk of losing God's approval? Guys, that doesn't, that's not logical. That, that's, that doesn't make any sense. To, to be so worried about what our unsaved relatives, uh, our, our, our co-workers who, who are shaking their fist at God and mocking the living God, uh, people who don't have time for God, they're not going to understand why you put your faith in Jesus if, they're, if they think there's more important things than God. Uh, when people don't want God in their lives, we want to love them. We want to bless them. We want to have compassion for them. We want to bring them close to Jesus. But we should not and dare not crave their affirmation. We don't need the world's stamp of approval. If we're getting the world's stamp of approval, we're probably not walking in step with the Holy Spirit. We need to be very clear and very careful about these things. We, We can totally miss the boat by being hungry for the approval of lost people. We all, all we need is God's approval, 
And think of it this way. What if, what if you're living in a community where there are no other Christians? And let's say there's 1,000 people in that community. So you've got 1,000 people and yourself. Well, what's bigger? 1,000 people. Uh, what has more weight? 1,000 people. Now I want you to factor in God. Infinity plus nothing is still bigger than everything else. Because God is infinite, He's all we need. He, he, when we're with God, we have everything. Uh, another point, some of the crowd rejected him outright, despite all the evidence, and others did believe in some sense again, but they're afraid of being uncomfortable because of Christ. C.S. Lewis said that if you want to be comfortable in religion, don't be a Christian. Christianity is not comfortable. Christianity sets us apart. Uh, the, the Romans, there was a, a Roman writer once uh, in the early days of Christianity, and he was mocking Christianity, and he said, who would want to be a Christian? They believe in a God that sits on your shoulder and hears everything you say and watches everything you do. <laughs> who would want such a God? And C.S. Lewis says, yes, God is the great interferer. God will mess with your life. God will take your self-righteousness and make it seem silly. God will take your pride and break it. God, God will take all, all of our willfulness and say, your will leads to dark places. Instead, follow my example and say, not my will, uh, but your will be done. Uh, be like Mary, who, say, who says, I am the Lord's maidservant. Let it be done unto me as you have said. Uh, we need to surrender ourselves and turn to the living God in all ways. Uh, how does Jesus, though, answer these two groups of people? One group rejects him outright. The second group kind of believes, but they're afraid to go public. They, they, they can't bring themselves to say, I'm a Christian. <laughs> They, there's still, there's something blocking them there. Uh, we see, what we're going to see next is the very last public words of Jesus Christ. Think about that. His last words that are heard to a large group. Uh, he's going to speak to his disciples quite a bit. He's going to be speaking words at his uh, trial. And he's going to be speaking words from the cross. But this is like his last uh, public message, his last public sermon. And so what all his life, all his public mission culminating at this point, what does he want to leave with the people? This is powerful. What does Christ really, really want us to get? And we have this darkness. We have people who would not believe, people who could not believe, people who are afraid of believing because of what other people would say. People's hearts are becoming hardened. And what does he say to them? What, is his, what does he want to impart? Uh, these, these words, he's on the way to the cross. Verse 44 says Jesus cried out. He's got something to say. It's, his, it's the passionate cry that some translations say he shouted. Well, I wish the pastor would settle down. Well, we worship, a, we worship a Savior who's shouting out the truth. This needs to come out because if people miss it, they miss God. Amen. And that's terrible. And so, in, so this erupts out of Christ. It's the cry of his heart. His heart's cry. This is what he wants us, us to hear. This is what the, he wants the world to hear. This is what is recorded in Scripture so that people in every culture and at every time could know. This is why he's shouting uh, this is the summation of his entire ministry, and we're going to look at that from 44 to the end of the chapter. Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. He and the Father are identical. They're together. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Is that politically correct? No. Do people living in darkness like to hear that? No, they don't. Jesus Christ had confidence. He knew who he was. And if we know who he is, we're going to proclaim that he is the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light. People living in darkness can find truth when they come to me. He who believes in me will no longer be in darkness. Let's look at this from verse 47. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Isn't this interesting? There's a real distinction here. Uh, I often hear people say, well, if God loves everybody, then why does he judge us? Brothers and sisters, 
we are already condemned. We are already judged because of the sin in our hearts. Jesus didn't come to point fingers. He said, we're already lost. It's, it's, it's like there's a boat, and Jesus is in the boat, and he's trying to grab drowning people out of the water. People are already in the water drowning and say, why is God pushing me in the water? Jesus said, you can deal with your theology later. I've got a hand here. <laughs> why don't you take my hand? I want to save you. God did not push us in the water. Jesus is reaching out to save everyone who will grab a hold. The invitation is for everybody. Uh, heaven's doors are wide open. The doors that are closed are the doors in our own hearts. The doors of heaven are wide open. And anyone who will come, who will have faith, who will believe, who will trust the living God. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but I came to save the world. This is God's perspective on this. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and that does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn that person on the last day because there was the ladder that you could have climbed to get out of the burning building and you rejected the ladder. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all I have spoken. There's some practical application here too. If the perfect Son of God says, I'm doing everything the way the Father wants it done, why in the world would you guys... And why in the world would we say, I think I'll do things my own way. I think I'll walk away from God's way. If Jesus was totally in sync with the Father, that's probably a good example for us too. And then verse 50, I know that his command leads to eternal life. This is the summation. All that darkness, they could not, they would, they would not, uh, they were afraid of what other people believed. And Jesus said, he shouts out this truth because he knows. He said, I know that his command leads to eternal life. That's why he came. That's why he wept at the, at the grave of Lazarus. He's coming to bring truth. He's coming to bring salvation. And that's why he's shouting it out to the world. Brothers and sisters, why would we keep this a secret? It doesn't make any sense. If we love people, we have to love them enough to be uncomfortable sometimes, right? And speak difficult truth because we know that what God is teaching us here leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. And when we try to apologize for God, well, the Bible really doesn't say that, and God's really not. And why in the world do we think we have to be interpreters for God? <laughs> Jesus said, I say just what the Father has taught me to say. Brothers and sisters, we want to say just what this scripture is teaching us to say. We want, to, we want to be God's people, uh, the Lord's man, the Lord's woman, wherever we go. Again, and you've heard me say this many times, there is no such thing as a God-forsaken workplace if you're there. There's no such thing as a God-forsaken school if you're there. If you are trusting the Lord in your neighborhood, it's not God-forsaken if he's put a light there, if he's put you there. We want to do and say the things that God has called us to do and say. Uh, verse 47 echoes all the way back to John chapter 3. Look at verse 47 again. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. All the way back to John chapter 3, verse 16. Remember that? One of the most famous verses in the Bible. Uh, and then we're going to keep going. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said, his last public ministry, I'm shouting this out because these, I know this teaching leads to eternal life. For God did not sin, send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they're already drowning because they did not believe in the name of God's one and only son. That's why we all need to grab a hold of that hand and get back in the boat. Think of it this way. We're almost done now. Think of it this way. In heaven, there's going to be a big party. Every, there's going to be ce celebration. There's going to be an endless joy. And people say, well, won't memories of this earth, in the tears and in the loved ones and all the pain and separation, diminish the glory of heaven? And there's a logical, I, I understand the emotion of that. In, in this side of heaven, we're not going to be able to deal with all that emotion. But, but there is a logical explanation. This world is finite, finite. All the pain of a finite world is overwhelmed by the goodness of an infinite God. 
infinite love, infinite glory, infinite beauty is going to overwhelm in just like a tidal wave crashing down and all our tears will be wiped away. This is the promise that God has given us. Uh, think of it this way. Jesus came to invite people to party, not keep them out. It's kind of silly to blame God for not letting you into the party when Jesus is actually standing at the door, holding it open, and inviting you in. Why is God kicking me out of the party? Again, you might want to deal with your theology later. I'm holding the door open for you. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. The question is, brothers, and sisters, friends, do you want to go in? Could you go? Could you? This would, could. Could you go? Yes. The door has been opened by the blood of Jesus Christ. The door is open for all who wish to enter. It's time to stop choking on forbidden fruit and let the Savior wipe away the tears of paradise lost. Salvation rejected is the most terrible thing possible. Salvation received the most wonderful. Jesus is crying out for all of us today, shouting out from his heart, we know that we're sinners, we know that we need a Savior, and he knows his words lead to eternal life. If we're Christians, let's leave behind all the junk that keeps us from walking with Christ. If you haven't yet declared your faith in Christ, don't wait until your wouldn't becomes your couldn't. It's time to leave worthless things and run to Christ. He will save you. He will save everyone who comes to him in faith. Amen.